Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome. I'm Raymond Anthony Parkon, a Jesuit working with Father George Williams at San Quentin State Prison and with Catholic Prison Ministries Coalition. Special welcome to those who are joining us for the first time. We are grateful for your interest in doing prison ministry. Um, visit our website, catholicprisonministries.org, to learn more about prison ministry resources and what we do at uh, CPMC. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted at our website. Again, it's catholicprisonministries.org. Go under resources and webinars where you can find our previous webinars and our list of webinars for this year, 2020. And speaking of our webinars for this year, I'd like to make a short plug for next month's webinar for the month of March. It's mark your calendars for March 10, how to minister to juveniles with Father Mike Kennedy and Robert Garcia with the Jesuit Restorative Justice Initiative or JRJI. Um, the title for our webinar for today is Critical Facts About Ministering to Sexual Offenders, the Mentally Ill, and the Addicted. We have two great panelists for today. First is Ms. Elizabeth Hardy. She has 20 years experience as a licensed independent clinical social worker. Before going into private practice, she worked with the New York City Fire Department, the Massachusetts prison system, and the Massachusetts Department of Probation and Parole. Our second speaker for today is Father Dustin Ferron, PhD, Executive Director of Joseph House. Uh, Father Dustin does prison ministry or pastoral ministry to the incarcerated throughout North Florida with emphasis on solitary confinement. Father Dustin earned his PhD in the study of religion from Florida State University. So we're glad that you guys are all here. Without further delay, I'll turn it over to our first panelist. Liz, it's all yours. Good afternoon, good morning, and welcome. Uh, today's presentation is gonna be, um, as Raymond said, on the critical facts about ministering to sexual offenders, the mentally ill, and the addicted. Um, as a, a little aside for today, today's focus on our webinar will be of those men um, and women, but primarily men that have been incarcerated and are reintegrating into the community. However, um, we will not be focused on the victims today. This will be primarily focusing on those that have been incarcerated and those that are um, re-entering into the community. So um, I'm gonna walk you through our PowerPoint with Father Dustin and I, and we will continue from there. Um, so these are some of the basic areas we're gonna talk about today, the critical areas. Um, kind of starting with breaking down the fears, stigmas, and assumptions um, when working with these types of people, whether inside uh, incarceration or outside. Um, some of the basic treatment issues and clinical issues that we address. Um, Megan's Law, which some of you may be familiar with, which is our, the Sex Offender Registry, which is probably one of the, the biggest hurdles for most of these men. Um, we'll discuss some reentry struggles they face, including housing, employment, the registry, treatment um, and family dynamics. And we'll also be discussing the comorbidity rates between mental illness, addiction, um, and these populations. Um, so here are some basic, and I'm sure a lot of you have some thoughts, but these are some basic things that come up often when we talk about our fears and our stigmas and, and versus statistics. So these men that have been incarcerated for sexual offenders, can be anybody. They are doctors, lawyers, teachers, brothers, neighbors, coworkers, anyone else we know, veterans, fathers. There is no discrimination. There is no prototype on who, who is a sexual, you know, someone who commits a sex offense. It can be anybody. Um, we do know that statistically rape is the most underreported crime. So I know someone had also typed in and written a question about that, but yes, 63% of sexual assaults are not reported to the police. So the ones that we're working with are men that have been caught and convicted and are serving time or have served time and are now reintegrating into the community. Um, one of the other misnomers um, is that eight out of 10 cases of rape, the victim knew the perpetrator. So yes, the headlines are very grabbing um, and, and the idea of someone you know, lurking in a bush and, and, and grabbing our, our kid and 
taking them and kidnapping them. Yes, those are those are horrific. However, that is not um, the norm. That's those are the headlines, and those are the ones that certainly get um, all of us worried and concerned, and understandably. However, um, less than one percent of reported sexual assaults include kidnapping. Um, and so often, I will say, unfortunately, you know, they don't announce every plane that lands. They only announce the planes uh, that crash. And so, you know, with that said, that most um, rape cases are by someone that people actually, people know. Um, with that, when we talk about treatment, uh, sex offenders have the lowest recidivism rate uh, compared to men who are incarcerated for other non-sexual offenses, homicide, robbery, home invasion, drug-related um, sex offenders um, who do a treatment program have the lowest recidivism rate as far as um, being reincarcerated for another sex offense. Um, so this is just another, this is just another um, slide showing um, the percentages of who um, victims are. And so looking at this, that a you know a large percentage, thirty nine percent, you know, just shy of half, is an acquaintance, someone they knew. Um, that nineteen percent is a is a stranger, um, and that a good thirty three percent is a spouse, a significant other. So someone, again, they're in a relationship with someone that they're close with. So if we look at that um, pie graph, um, a good portion of this is, as we can see, is by people they know. Um, and the red slice there, the 6%, that's um, plus one person or no memory. That makes up a portion of people that had more than one perpetrator and or they have no recollection and no memory. Um, and there's multiple reasons for that, whether there was drug, uh, drug involvement or um, a medical injury or whatever, but that, that's a small percentage. And then the 3% is a non-spouse relative, um, and that can also be someone they're in a relationship with, however, it's a non-spouse. Non so that's just a visual for that. Um, so when the men um, are incarcerated or doing a treatment program, here in Massachusetts, the treatment program is 36 months. It's a three-year program um, that men um, can engage, can participate in if they are within five years of their release date. Um, and these are some of the basic things that are asked of them within the program. So the first um, part of the program is acknowledging their sexual offenses um, and the victims they've created. Um, with this said, um, and I think someone had actually written in about um, victims that had not been reported. And so part of the program is that, you know, if, if, a, if a man is serving time for a sexual offense on a you know, particular one, one victim, part of the program is asking him to look at other behaviors that would have created other sexual offenses and to disclose those as part of the program. So they are asked to look at all their behavior. Um, and that segues into one of the first assignments is an autobiography. Uh, and their autobiography is written so that it starts with childhood, um, and it's pretty thorough, you know, childhood up until the time of their incarceration and different things that they've experienced in their childhood, as well as their views and, and how they grew up, um, what their home may have looked like, what they had seen and witnessed, um, their own substance abuse, sometimes their own um, sexual victimization, um, kind of how their, their, their views and core beliefs um, have been formed. Um, and then the next part of the program will be um, they're learning how to understand their deviant, deviant sexual assault cycle. And the idea of that is that there's a cycle and there's a buildup and that a sexual a sex offense doesn't just happen um, and that there are a series of um, triggers and uh, core beliefs and things that lead them to get to that place where they sexually act out. And so the men spend a lot of time working on that and understanding how they came to committing a sexual offense. Um, and then as part of that, understanding that they work through identifying their triggers and their core beliefs, which are the beliefs about themselves that led them to their sexual offending. Um, most of these men have no I idea looking into themselves and, and they know how they committed their offense, but not clear on kind of how they grew up and, and different events in their life that led them to the, the poor choices they made to, to their sexual offending. Um, another part uh, the next part of the cycle, and this is probably, you know, into year two, if not two and a half, and they work on writing a victim impact letter. Uh, this letter is not mailed to the victim, but it is written as if it was. 
Um, and the assignment is for them to take responsibility and acknowledging um, the damage that they have, the damage they have done and looking at what transpired from their offense and how it affected not just them, not just the victim, but that they have created, that their families, their community, the victim's family, the victim's community, um, we often refer to it as a, a ripple effect, um, similar to that of a, a pond, you know, a stone dropped in a pond um, and the ripples of the victims that they've created and the impact their, uh, their behavior has had. Um, and then the last kind of part of the program is the, um, is the empathy and remorse in rebuilding and restoring empathy and remorse. And we're often, the men are told that they have to learn empathy, that most of them were never taught it. It was never displayed for them and therefore coming in and having several years while incarcerated, um, have no idea what it's like to, to have empathy for another human being and or remorse and remorse for what they have done, the victims they created, as well as empathy for themselves and where they have gotten. Um, and then wrapping up the program becomes the self-healing and recovery and really looking at over the three years, what they've learned, understanding their offense um, and how they can you know, re-enter and reintegrate into the community as a healthier, safer person. Uh, Father Dustin, are there some questions there? So uh, we have a few are coming in here. Uh, what, one question I, I know that is raised often, uh, and we may be covering that you may, we may be covering this a little bit later in the in the presentation, Liz, is you know we have uh, you know we have the the term sexual assault, uh, sex offender, but we also know that there's a very wide spectrum within these categories. Uh, how do we, or how does the kind of the professional environment uh, define the, the spectrum within sexual offense and sexual assault? Say from, you know, predator to uh, what seemed to be, again, you know, this is something that I have heard these stories in the prisons of young men that were, you know, 20 years old and having sexual encounters with their 17 year old girlfriend or vice versa for that matter. Uh, and how do we, so in other words, how do we identify the, the spectrum or is there a spectrum that say the professional, uh, you know, professionals, professionals are looking at in terms of those who have been charged with a sexual crime? So as far as the incarceration and the treatment program within the prison system here in Massachusetts, and, and actually it's the same model as New Hampshire, um, they do not separate or segregate or kind of like you're saying, um, is that the idea is that a victim has been created. And certainly in the treatment world, we will uh, distinguish the difference between let's say an, an aggravated rape versus, as you're saying, a 17 year old, you know, having sex with his girlfriend in something like a statutory rape. Unfortunately, nowadays we also, I mean, urinating in public, if you are caught urinating in public, um, that is, is open and gross, your genitals are exposed and you also um, are considered a, a, a sexual uh, offender and, and therefore put on the registry, which is, which is really awful in some ways, you know, and the, the Sex Offender Registry Board has levels. Um, I know Florida, certainly you guys have, have your system down there and up here we do have, so based on your crime of conviction. So, you know, there's several, a lot of men have several counts, but at the end, what they're actually convicted of, that will determine where they are placed on the registry. And from there, that's how that's segregated. So often if you are caught urinating in public and, um, can't seem to beat that. Uh, you're a level a level one, and in Massachusetts, a level one, you are not placed on the internet. Here in Massachusetts, level twos and threes are on the internet, um, and that causes obviously a lot of concern and, and difficulties for the men regarding housing and employment and those types of things. But there is um, so based on the crime of conviction, the Sex Offender Registry Board levels them based on their dangerousness. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Liz. Uh, one question that has come in from one of our uh, attendees here uh, is that saying some that try to re-enter society have trouble being admitted to social organizations like uh, the, I guess, the Boy Scouts or the Eagles or the Elks. Uh, they go on to say we have had success with Vietnam veterans of America or VF and VFW for veterans. Have you found any groups that are okay with admitting 
non-vet uh, sex offenders? You know, this is certainly one of the biggest hurdles because actually it segues into this good lives model, which is the treatment model out of Canada. And, and a lot of the research for working with sex offenders comes from Canada um, and this good lives model from um, Yates and Prescott. And so it's looking at the focus for the men once they've gone into the community is not so much focusing on their crime and what they've done, but the idea of like, how do we prevent them from, from reoffending? Well, we know that if they're living a good life and a good, you know, and they have these things in place, and I'll go through them, that they have a much greater chance of success in, in, in being in society. So you're right, it becomes this hurdle of a lot of these organizations don't um, want them or won't allow them to be part of it. And so then we have this vicious cycle where they're ostracized in the community and how do we get them to feel involved and be a part of it. Um, but believe it or not, the church, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of my men that I've worked with outside of the incarceration are involved um, in church programs, in youth ministry. Um, they're involved in young adult or depending on their crime, they cannot be involved in the youth ministry if they have a crime against a child, but if their crime is against adult. Um, I have a, I have a, currently have a, a client who's in actually Ohio who was doing, he's doing, he was doing life and got parole. And so he's involved in Orthodox community and Orthodox Jewish community um, and been very successful there. Um, as far as Boy Scouts, certainly anything to do with children is very difficult. Um, any sort of organization with Boy Scouts, kids, schools, sporting events, um, we have not found success with that. Um, right, yeah, and that, uh, just to chime in here, Liz, that's been my experience as well. There are, uh, it, and any, you know, and that oftentimes involves, you know, involvement in the church uh, or in, you know, any other kind of church activities, even slightly related with, say, children or youth. Uh, uh, you know, and I also know that there are many reentry ministries, reentry organizations that will take uh, nonviolent offenders, mm -hmm. a good number that will take violent offenders, uh, but many of them will not take those who have sex offenses. Uh, and, and yet those are the ones that, uh, you know, will oftentimes find greater isolation upon release clearly. So it is a great challenge. Uh, and I think there's a lot of work to be done in identifying, you know, good reputable organizations that have a very clear mission to serve those who have sex offenses. Uh, but, yeah, and there's one question here that just came up for you, Liz, as well, uh, is, let's see, how do you find the victim impact letter effective and to what extent? Um, you know, when working with it, we and it's done towards the end of the program, we find it very effective. Um, and so the men are, they write actually three of them. They write a victim impact letter to the victim, which again, is not mailed. Um, they write a victim impact to others. And it's to others, meaning to other people that have been affected um, by their offense. So generally it is written to their family, um, sometimes their own children. And the idea of getting them really to look at how this offense has impacted several, several people, that ripple effect. And then the last assignment actually is they have to write a letter to themselves. When we talk about letter and it's really kind of wrapping up, looking at everything they've learned in the program and learned like, wow. How, how I got here and how this happened. And I didn't just wake up one day and have a bad day and, and commit a sex offense. There's a series of events. And so we find it effective in that at the, by the time they're writing their victim impact letter, they're you know two thirds away through the program and they're able to understand empathy. They're able to understand remorse. They're able to understand the impact their behavior has had um, and not just their behavior, their sexual offense, but even other behaviors, abusive behaviors along the way. A lot of them were, were batterers in abusive relationships. A lot of them, as we talk about with addictions, so looking at all of their behavior and they're at a place where they can understand. And, and it's usually part of the most emotional um, and toughest part of the program because the men really begin to grasp what, what they have done and the impact that has long lasting effects. Thanks, Liz. Um, I was gonna add one other thing, uh, Father Dustin, about talking about community programs. Um, kind of 
you know, piggybacking here is that a lot of men struggle with addiction. Um, so certainly AA and NA is a place that uh, a lot of a lot of my men on the outside for, for addiction purposes, but I do have men that will go to AA and, and say that it's a find a place that they're accepted, that it's a non-judgmental place, a place. And so certainly in AA or NA, um, they are not asking, you know, you're, they're not doing a background check. They're not doing a quarry. And so it is a place where men do find to avoid that isolation where they can find um, other people that are struggling. And sometimes it's a way to connect. That's another avenue we use certainly up here is connecting men with AA and NA meetings in order to find um, some sense of community. Um, so this, uh, this uh, slide you see here is a good lives model I started to tell you. And so this focus, um, it's been in the last 15 years, we've really looked at changing the focus. Certainly while incarcerated, the focus is on the offense and, and what the men did, but realizing then they're released and put out into the community and kind of like, now what? So the focus in Canada has done a lot of research that the, the men that have, you know, like I said earlier, the sex offenders have less, those that complete a treatment program have less than 1% recidivism rate. Um, and that's because they're given tools and skills to be able to, to go back out into to society. And so these are the areas that they found um, focus on. And so, you know, there's a workbook that goes with this. These are just, I put the bullet points for you, but there's an entire workbook that the men work on. And a lot of this is done once they're outside. Um, a lot of men that have been convicted of a sex offense usually are released and they're released on parole and pro probation up here in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And while on parole and probation, they will remain in treatment outside. So I run a group, they attend group once a week and we work in this workbook to go over some of these things and finding ways for them to be a part of the community and live a good life. Um, so the first one is living and surviving, which is just basically figuring out where, where can they live, certainly within the parameters of their probation rules and guidelines within the sex offender registry board guidelines. We'll get to that. Um, knowledge, learning and, and knowing and realizing that these men, some of them had skills before they were incarcerated, others of them, were incarcerated for 30 or 40 years, but were able to obtain skills while inside and or even degrees. And so looking, helping them identify what skills they have and how can they use those skills, whether they've learned, they've gotten their barber's license inside or they've gotten their um, uh, machine or mechanics. And so helping them find ways to feel good about their skills and potentially finding work. Um, being good at work and play. You know, this idea that they have been released and that they are allowed have fun. It needs to be safe and healthy and all of that, but they are allowed, you know, to work and also have fun and helping them look at what that looks like. Because for a lot of them, given their uh, drug and alcohol history, their idea in the past prior to incarceration was, you know, being in unsafe places that included drugs and alcohol. So now it's helping them learn, well, what would something enjoyable look like today without drugs and alcohol, without being in unsafe areas and with people. So um, personal choice and independence helping them feel independent. You know, they've been incarcerated, most of them for a lengthy amount of time and helping them look at, okay, now once back in the community, I have choices. Um, I can, you know, wh what do I want to do? What do I want for my life now? And how can I live independently, but also within those parameters of um, probation or parole or sex offender registry board, depending on. Um, peace of mind. We look at this and looking at, you know, this kind of ties in with spirituality, but helping them find peace, helping them find they've done their, their treatment program, they've found, or we hope that they have an awareness now of victim empathy and remorse and helping them be able to, you know, shame and guilt are motivators we use in treatment, but they can also be very paralyzing. Um, and I know we talk about the suicide rate. And so we try to help them recognize they've done the treatment. Um, they're at a better place. They're, they're not the same they are the same person, but they're not the same person when they came in when they were incarcerated. Often we will say good people make bad choices. Um, a lot of them by the end feel like they're a bad person and because they've done bad things. And so similar uh, to when working with juveniles is that, you know, good people make bad choices and the emphasis on the choices that you made and why you made those choices, but that today you understand differently. Um, relationship and friendships is a huge one, helping them understand, you know, a lot of them have been inside and they, they quickly want to jump into a relationship um, and kind of helping them slow down 
and, and getting established before jumping into a relationship and what, what does a healthy relationship look like? Um, a majority of the men had not even seen or been a, around healthy relationships, let alone having been in one themselves. So helping them look at friendships and what that looks like um, and identifying some, some of the basic things that most of us are aware of that some of these men have no, no concept of. Um, we talk about community, which we talked about earlier, is, is much harder for them, but the importance of it. So finding where they can be part of a community. And certainly that's, that's challenging, but it's helping them and working with them and, and not giving up. That it may not be with Boy Scouts, it may be with the church, it may be with AA, and, and, and depending on where they're living and what they're doing, what they, what they can do and what they can be a part of. And Liz, if I can just uh, jump in here real quick, because we have a question that I think pertains to, well, a lot of these, but this particular topic of community. Uh, one of our uh, attendees writes that uh, I work with many offenders who are nearing the max dates of their 30 to 40 year sentence with sex crimes against children. Generally, they are around 60 to 70 years old. They are terrified that there will be no options for them as far as housing and employment. They have minimal risk of reoffending, but their fear often leads to high risk of suicide while incarcerated. Any suggestions working with those populations? Yes, I mean, I, I recently, I think I shared, I'd worked with, with a man who did uh, 43 years incarcerated and he got out, he was 61. He had been in since he was 17 and pretty much raised in the system. Uh, he's in Ohio now. And we did a lot of work um, trying to proactively before they're released, trying to set things up for them. Um, so certainly if you've been incarcerated for 30 to 40 years, we often say you've been raised in the system. I mean, the system has raised you. Um, and so trying to set them up um, with potentially halfway, there are halfway homes. I know Salvation Army um, here in Massachusetts will take um, some men that um, have sexually offended even against children if they're over a certain age because statistically their risk of reoffense significantly goes down. Um, after the age of like 57, if we look at a, a statistic, a, a testing tool they use, this, this stable 2007. Um, so often we, we would hope that while incarcerated, if we can connect them with people on the outside or having them work with people on the outside to find ways to proactively have things in place when they get out, um, that's one of the, the best ways, certainly, because just being dropped out, you know, kind of given the, the keys to say, here you go. Um, is certainly difficult and, and we know here in Massachusetts uh, the shelters um, struggle to take in men that have committed sex offenses and they're overcrowded um, obviously up here due to the weather especially so that's another issue we do, we do face. Great thanks Liz. Um, spirituality um, again having meaning in life and so we often talk it doesn't necessarily be doesn't have to be religion. Um, a recent study shows that um, people, not just men, but men and women that believe in something other than themselves. So depending, it doesn't have to, again, difference between religion and spirituality, but the idea that this concept of something greater or higher power than yourself lives seven years longer. So we really encourage the men to find some level of spirituality. And again, whatever that is, be it a religion or some sort, and we encourage them to kind of work with some meditation and just, again, going back to finding peace and have finding meaning. And, and for most of them, there was prior to incarceration, no, no meaning in their life and, and hoping, helping them establish what that meaning is. Um, and with that, that kind of moves into happiness and creativity and this idea of them redefining what happiness looked like. You know, prior for a lot of men, I'm sure Father Dustin, you hear the stories, I would you know, get my, my paycheck, I would cash it as soon as I could, I would go to the bar and I would drink and drug my entire paycheck away and I was happy. Well, probably not happy. Um, so redefining what happiness looks like, redefining how to re reconnect with family, um, make new friendships that are that are safe, um, as well as creativity. That a lot of these men, you know, their focus has been on their crime or their survival and incarceration, and now once out, you know, helping them explore what again talents, skills they have, what what they may have learned on the inside, and how they can apply that to the outside to kind of going back to living a well balanced life. Um, we use word balance a lot. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, Liz, a, a few questions that have come in. One is um, uh, someone noted uh, that that we didn't mention uh, Sex uh, Addicts Anonymous with AA and NA. Is, 
Any thoughts about that or uh, what's been your experience with uh, Sex Addicts Anonymous and, and how that might or might not be useful, helpful for those that are uh, formerly incarcerated for sexual offenses? So, so we up here, um, there is, we, we have SLAA up here, uh, Sex Loves Addictions Anonymous, um, and there are meetings. It's, it's dicey um, because for, for some men, it can be very triggering. So um, later on the slides, we'll talk about sexual offending behavior kind of versus s sexual addiction, more immoral, um, you know, the difference between immoral behavior and illegal behavior. Um, so SLAA gets a little bit, Again, we, we have to be very careful. And so that's one of the ones I say we suggest case by case or, you know, person by person only because um, similar to AA or NA, they're talking about their experiences, their triggers, what they, how they may have relapsed. And again, in SLA, they're relapsing with sexually acting out. Um, and these men are, a lot of them can be very hyper-sexualized to begin with. And so putting them in a room with other men that are that are talking about this um, at times can be very triggering to their deviancy. So that's one of the ones that we, especially up here, we kind of use case by case and person by person. But certainly, yeah. absolutely, it's another avenue for community. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Uh, another question that has come up, and I know that we're primarily focusing on men, uh, but any, any anecdotal uh, uh, information or experiences with women uh, in, in their treatment uh, while incarcerated and, and post-incarceration? So I have limited, limited work with women that have been incarcerated um, for sex offenses. However, I'm aware of some of the, the research and the programs. Um, it, it's very different than men. Um, you know, the, the program is, is similar but different. Obviously, there's a lot less and, and partly is there's a lot less reported. But we know, unfortunately, that a lot of women um, that are caught, they're caught up in they're caught up in some sort of uh, prostitution um, and that for women, um, they, the issues they face are much different because most of them, is, most of them are, are mothers or have had their children taken or are pregnant. And so the issues that the women face is definitely different and their um, sex offenses are, are different in different dynamics, so to say. And so there's a different, it's just a different program and we don't, they, the research just isn't as abundant because there's just not as many of them. But there are, in, in, in here in Massachusetts, we have one women's state um, correctional facility and there are some identified and convicted female sex offenders and they are working um, in a program and developing it, but looking at how their offenses differ greatly from the men. Obviously women have a tendency to have nonviolence um, offenses and a lot of them have been their own victims of certainly domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, okay, ready to move on, Dr. Father Dustin? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Okay. Um, so Megan's Law, I'm sure most of you have heard of, and those that haven't, Megan's Law is the law that um, required the Sex Offender Registry um, Notification Act, or called SONAR. Um, in 1994, um, Megan Kanka, um, she was uh, raped and murdered by a neighbor. However, he had two previous sex offenses that no one knew. Um, and so from that, Megan's parents fought hard to make sure that that never happened to anybody, that nobody ever, nobody ever was in the position to have a neighbor living next door to them that had sex offenses that they were not aware of. Um, the registration, so every state has a sex offender registry board as far as the offenses, as far as what um, the length of registration definitely varies state to state. Um, and then again, in July 2006, um, the Adam Walsh Protection Act was signed and that, that mandated the tiers. And I think, um, Father Dustin, you were speaking about how we have the level three, a level two, a level one, um, or a dangerous predator. And in Massachusetts, um, originally it was only level threes that were on, um, that were on the internet for everyone to see. And then back in 2010, uh, it changed to level twos and level threes were on the internet. So basically anyone can type in someone's name and if they're on the registry, they can see their face, they can see where they live. Um, and this is really challenging for the men because it feels often like a double jeopardy that they're, they're still serving. Often they'll say, I finished my, I wrapped up my sentence, I'm done, I'm no longer incarcerated. However, now 
outside um, the, the leper of society. And you know, often I can't live places because people won't rent apartments to those on a sex offender registry. And so this becomes very challenging. Um, and it does vary state to state. Like I said, um, I have had some men that um, have gotten a little bit creative where they have pled uh, to an assault in another state, being aware that they were gonna move to Massachusetts. Um, because that offense is not registrable in Massachusetts. So they were convicted of a sex offense that is in the registration in another state. And however, in Massachusetts, it's not a registrable offense. Um, I do know that that a lot of states are in the works to have it kind of federally across the board that, you know, all these offenses across all 50 states will be registrable. But as of now, it does vary state to state and their length of being on um, the SORB is also state to state. Um, so that's where that comes from. And this is probably single-handedly the, the biggest hurdle for these men when they are released is dealing with the Sex Offender Registry Board. Um, they have to register their home address. And if they're working, they have to register their work address. So that becomes another issue where a lot of employers then don't want their work address tied to then someone who's committed a sexual offense. I mean, this raises, you know, yeah, sorry to kind of oh, jump absolutely. in here, uh, Liz, but th this kind of, you know, it, going back to the previous slide uh, is it just, this raises the uh, great challenge of building community, you know, for those that are on, on these registrations. I, I, it's hard for me to imagine anyone having serious complaints about the importance of some degree of registration given history uh, and uh, especially with, with the, uh, Megan, uh, Megan's situation and with the neighbors there, but I think it, you know, it, it raises the challenge of, of how do we build community and create that very important sense of inclusion, uh, and then at the same time, uh, kind of maintain this, you know, the practice of registries and, you know, whether it's kind of figuring out ways of, of you know, creating a kind of degrees of, of registration and based upon the crimes that were committed uh, are creating identified you know spaces where these you know where, where individuals these men can come and uh and, you know participate in community but all it also be a, a very known safe environment to do so uh so it's this this bind that i'm just i obviously i think it's a challenge that's yet to have been fully kind of uh rectified well, we often hear, I, I often hear, it's like the not in my backyard syndrome where people will say, yeah, no, absolutely. We know that men that are part of a community and have fulfillment and have a job and are working and have a place to live are far less likely to reoffend. So we say, that's great. So they should be allowed to rent an apartment and they should be able to get a job here and there. And then, oh yeah, that's great, but not in my backyard, not in my community. So we, we certainly see this very much up here where people will, will agree with the things we talked about here, Father Dustin, but it's like, yeah, but not here. You can do that someplace else. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it, it's a double-edged sword because we understand why they have the registry, however, it becomes very limiting and the men get caught in this, this vicious cycle, then they can't establish things. And then it's like, well, why bother? I'm better off back inside. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. And so we try to do everything we can to prevent them from feeling that way. Um, so this is just a, a map or a grid. I just wanted to, again, I think because often the, the sex offenses are what, what makes the headlines of the news, um, but that looking at what our prison population is by offense, um, and certainly now we know a majority of our, our inmates are serving time for drug offenses, um, and then going down, weapons, arson, immigration, but that sex offenses make up a small portion of it. So that although they, the ones that make the headlines are, are horrific, it is a small portion of what makes up the incarcerated population. Um, more so just to talk about the, the, the fears and stigmas that you know, people may have. Um, uh, and I, sorry, am I, yep. okay, just a, a question about that graph, if, if we can go back. That's, sure. is, that, is that yearly? Is that, that, what is that, up to about 100,000 it looks like that are? Correct, yep, it's 100,000, correct. Up to 100,000, and so, because we know that there's what, it's about 2.5, million or so that are currently incarcerated that that's what that's what, that's the most recent one i had heard of. i think 2.4 yeah something around there so then this is 20 000, so then just for my own understanding we're saying about what about seventeen thousand out of 2.5 million that are currently incarcerated are charged with sex offenses is that right that's correct 
Wow. And, and we also know, and I'm, I mean, again, I'm aware that these certainly men, men that have um, lawyers, I mean, they, they will plead out to anything that's not a sex offense. Um, so I certainly have men that, although probation will mandate them to a group because their, their crime had elements and it was a sex offense, but maybe they were able to get an attorney to plead them down to some sort of assault and battery, although there were sexual components to it or something. So they're in group because they acknowledge that there were sexual components and ultimately it was a sex offense. However, they had a, a good attorney to help them kind of get around that and, and primarily to avoid the sex offender registry, the registry ultimately. Um, all right, so talking about reentry, and we've kind of touched upon some of this already, um, Father Dustin, but these are some of the hurdles the men face, you know, the, the men that are coming up and like a question someone had said, especially the ones that have done 30 or 40 years, um, but housing, you know, where, where can they live in the affordability? Um, most of these men certainly don't have a savings account, um, and, and where are they allowed to live based on the sex offender registry? Um, here in Massachusetts, if you are a level three, um, you can't live within like two and a half miles of a school, a playground, a park, um, a daycare. So although that doesn't sound like a lot, when you begin to look at communities, it really is. It's very limiting where they can live then because there is, you know, every community has a few elementary schools and a middle school and a daycare and a playground. And so it becomes very challenging um, to find housing. And so we work really hard with probation and parole um, a lot of them have some resources of places that will take in or, or um, community apartments that, that will rent or rooming houses here that will rent to men that are on um, the registry. And some of them, because they're on probation, the idea that they have a level of supervision. So that sometimes helps them. Um, initially, men don't want to be on probation or parole, but when realizing it actually could be a help to them, that, you know, uh, employment. Their limited skills. Certainly, they've got a felony. You know, all the, the employments now ask, have you been convicted of a felony? It used to be here in Massachusetts. It was, have you been convicted of a felony within the last seven years? And I had many men that had served 15 or 20 years and would say, nope, hasn't been in the last seven years, um, which was a loophole, but again, the truth. But now um, the employment here in Massachusetts, it just says, have you ever been convicted of a felony? So certainly they have, and that becomes, again, very challenging. Um, we do have here in Massachusetts a lot of um, my manual labor places will hire men um, with sex, offen sex offenses or with a felony. And so there's a list we try to help provide lists of places that will will hire guys that have been released. Um, obviously, the sex offender registration, the limitations that come with that, the Internet, um, neighbors, family, um, and the broader things. Um, treatment. You know, a lot of the men that, that get out, either they're mandated to treatment because of probation or parole, or we highly encourage it. Um, but again, it's looking at where the treatment is offered, how can they get there, because transportation, again, is an issue, as well as insurance and payment. Um, so those are also hurdles the men face where they say, yeah, I, I, I want to participate in treatment, I want to continue my therapy, but I can't get to group, which is half an hour away, or I can't afford group. Um, and so helping them get insurance or ways to find payment um, for treatment. Family reconnection, and this one certainly is, is a loaded one depending on who their victims are um, and depending on what the you know, um, pieces were to their incarceration. And some of them have no family involved and others have family that have stayed connected. Um, the men in our program here in Massachusetts, in order to complete the program, the three-year program, you have to have what's called a family visit and it's two one and a half hour visits. Um, and we sit with um, the incarcerated men, uh, their family, whoever they have for their family visit, they can have up to three people. Um, they have to sit, myself, the therapist, um, and the men have to walk through their deviant sexual assault cycle with their um, family visit. The idea is that if the family is aware on how this, um, how their family, you know, offender uh, thought, acted, then they know how to look for warning signs. We talk a lot about warning signs and triggers and ways to identify if someone were struggling once on the outside. And so in order to complete the, the three-year program um, here in Massachusetts, they have to have a, a family visit. And I say family, but that also many men have no family. And so we find ways, and this is where, especially the ministry, where I've had several men have made connections with someone ministering and they become 
that family person for them to do their, their visit and to help them on the outside. Um, and then obviously the per, uh, probation and parole. Um, here in Massachusetts, if you've been um, convicted after 2010 um, of any sex offense, you'll be on a GPS ankle bracelet and you'll have a curfew, which also, again, this leads to hurdles with jobs and employment, um, also where living um, for a while, only up until the last 2017, the ankle bracelet required you to have a home phone, a phone jack. A lot of men weren't able to afford that. That became another issue and probation and parole were violating them. So they continue to work the kinks out now with um, Wi-Fi and, and stuff. They, they've gotten around that with the ankle bracelet. But all the men here in Massachusetts um, that are out on probation or parole um, must wear a GPS ankle bracelet and they all have a curfew. And, and the curfew is dependent upon um, their probation or parole officer, but the ankle bracelet is mandated by the state. Great. Uh, quick question here that's come in, uh, Liz. Uh, is there any, any data since 1994 to establish that the registry has reduced incidents of sexual assault and or has reduced recidivism? Well, so we, I, I don't know about recidivism because the recidivism studies that I'm aware of, especially ones that come out of Canada, which is a lot of the research and they've done that research here, is that the treatment is single-handedly um, the piece that lowers the recidivism rate. So again, men that complete a treatment program have less than 1% of a recidivism rate. I am aware, and I, and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I do know that, and I want to say it was early 2000, there was some research done regarding Megan's Law and that the sex offender registry had reduced, um, ha had had a benefit to reducing some recidivism rate. However, the asterisk next to that was, it had also caused other um, I'll use an anarchy behavior of people um, lashing out and acting out against men on the registry simply because they were on the registry and they had an offense against a child. So people just kind of looking for people on the internet and recognizing that, you know, Liz Hardy lives here and has a crime against a child and therefore then um, acting out against them. So that's, that is the downside yeah. that, to that piece. And, and I know just uh, as well that many guys in prison while incarcerated, I've heard stories of guards announcing to the whole dorm of a new guy coming in, identifying him as a sex offender. Uh, and and I, I mean, I, I've multiple stories, Liz, that I've heard of guys being beaten, uh, guys witnessing it, guys being the victims of it because they've been identified as a, uh, as a sexual predator or as a sex offender. So the, the abuse that goes on certainly outside, but also there's a lot of abuse that goes on inside. Absolutely. So here, here in Massachusetts, which, which is good, um, and, and where I worked is the uh, Massachusetts State Treatment Center. It is a facility that houses about 2,000 men, and everyone in that facility all has a sex offense. So men initially will, um, when convicted, go to one of our other, our other prisons and intake. And a lot of times, if they have a sex offense, they're put in segregation or solitary until they're transferred to the, to the treatment center. Because at the treatment center, it's a facility that houses only sex offenders. So everyone in the building, and, and part of that is exactly that, to prevent because of the horrific abuse that goes on when men, get, or when men are placed in general population with a sex offense, because they are the, the lowest of the low. Um, and unfortunately, the abuse, as you said, Augustin, is horrific that goes on. Well, it's, it sounds like Massachusetts is light years ahead of many of us uh, in, in the country. And just in terms of identifying treatment programs and also separating from the rest of the general population, uh, just again, because I mean, I'm sure there's downsides to that perhaps as well. But I'm just thinking of the level of abuse and, and violence inflicted on them by guards and inmates because they've been ad identified as um, sexual predators is, is uh, pretty enormous just in, in other areas. One question that came in uh, as well, Liz, was that they're uh, saying, my research says about 750,000 are on the sex registry. Does that sound right? It sounds about right. Okay. Um, and, and you know, again, it, it, it's tough because Unfortunately, and I had done some work in Colorado working with, with juvenile offenders, and they were really up and coming, and this is back in the early 2000s. And again, um, 
you know, the pendulum swings, but, but having worked with some boys that had got caught, you know, on a school bus, they were riding and they were like pantsing each other, you know, pulling down their, their pants and parents, you know, calling and complaining and, and they were adjudicated in juvenile and a sex offender and pulled from their homes. Um, it was awful. I worked um, in a program with these, these boys, had, like I said, and so some of them had more traditional sex offenses, but certainly some of them had just basic kids behavior that maybe maybe was inappropriate or boundary violating, but certainly wasn't a sex offense, but Colorado had really swung um, the other way. And so I do know that, you know, when looking at the registry, it's, it's a huge issue that certainly you have men that are, are predatory, dangerous, that have, you know, kind of like Megan Kanka, guys that have had crimes against children, but also looking at uh, men that may have had an offense and, and also that their offense may have been, as one of our participants said, th you know, 30 or 40 years ago. We know statistically their rate of reoffense is significantly diminished. Um, so people look at the registry and look at all the facts, like looking at when their conviction was. If their conviction was 30 years ago and they're still on the registry, but looking at they've been in the community now for 30 years, safe and offense free. Well, uh, Liz, I know you know we're coming to the final couple of minutes here for the <laughs> webinar, and I'm wondering if we can talk maybe just a little bit about. Um, about uh, what what those that are involved in prison ministry uh, can do, or you know, and what 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 can we, those of us in prison ministry, uh, and those, especially those of us that work uh, with those with some of those that we work with, are in incarcerated due to sex offenses, sexual assault. Uh, how can we engage the literature uh, that that you provided us? You know, the research that is out there and implement it in our pastoral presence or our pastoral ministries kind of on the ground, both incarcerated uh, and then also perhaps in re-entry. Uh, are, there, are there resources, maybe even just immediate resources that you can think of that this would be a really go-to resource for applying to, to ministry? You know, I think some of that is, is really state by state, Father Dustin, and depending on what the state resources are and what, like we talked about, different groups in certain states that allow, but certainly, um, you know, these men, as one of our attendees said, th these men probably feel more alone than anyone else, more isolated, um, more like society, they are the pariah. So whether it's, like you said, even on the inside, so whether it's, you know, being there for them and listening to them and, and helping them know that there is a future, that they can make it on the outside and what that would look like. And then certainly for those that are ministering to them on the outside, helping them with, with, with basic resources and that, you know, you or I or any one of probably these attendees, we can certainly, you know, Google something quickly or find something where these men, most of them have never even, you know, experienced Google or, or just basic ways of helping them get connected with um, sometimes just food pantries, uh, housing shelter, like things that would seem simple for, for us, for these men are, are very overwhelming. Um, although they've survived in prison, that for you and I seems unimaginable. The outside is, is I've heard so many men, it's overwhelming. Um, as you know, on the inside, they're told when to eat, when to shower, when to stand, when, you know, and now on the outside to have that freedom, that freedom is very scary and overwhelming. And so I think ministering to them is really helping them and, and guide them and, and letting, reminding them that they're not alone and that, that we can help find places where they can be part of a community. Great. Um, also, uh, and, and, and uh, Liz, feel free to, um, if, yeah, if you had anything else, kind of final thoughts for the, um, with the slide here. Uh, but, you know, what, one quick, quick question that did come up here uh, is any, you know, any, any practical advice on encouraging, uh, you know, both prison ministers uh, and those perhaps that we minister to that are incarcerated that are not sexual offenders on how to be accepting and just basic you know kind kindness and and and, and compassionate towards those who walk uh kind of you know who are who have these uh charges in their history yeah I, I, that word you use I, I love is, is compassion and i often try to say that over and over with the with these men, whether they've had a, an offense, sex offense or not, is that compassion that these are these are humans and they've made a mistake, a horrible mistake. Um, but that not all, as I said earlier, that good people make bad choices or bad mistakes. And so helping them understand that we we work hard, that their offense does not define them, 
And so regardless of their charge, so whether they're in for, for murder or, or you know, arson or whatever, that not allowing that, you know, their offense to define them. So especially with the offenders, I'll opt we don't refer to them as sex offenders. We'll say they're, they're you know, a man or someone who's committed a sex offense. And so that you're also a brother or an uncle and a carpenter and, you know, whatever, but that not allowing them to wear kind of the scarlet letter, letter and, and allowing their offense to define them. And so that's going back to compassion and, and helping them have compassion for others and having compassion for themselves. Um, when people, you know, if, ask me what I do, and occasionally if I say that I work with these men, they, you know, usually it's, oh, wow, how, do, you know, how do you do that? And I'll often say everyone has a story and that, you know, they, they, they are people and they have a story and, and they got here somehow and it's getting to know them and getting to understand how they got to making those choices, whether it's homicide or arson or a sex offense, that they are, they're people that have made poor choices, but there, there's a reason and, and helping them understand so that, that that doesn't happen again. Well, uh, thank you, Liz, for the, uh, the slideshow. We can go ahead and, and perhaps just uh, stop the uh, the share uh, the, the screen share there as we enter in here the, the, the final uh, two or three minutes for the webinar. Uh, you know, what one thing that uh, kind of has been my experience is any anyone that has uh, charges of violent offenses, and, and I'm including in that sex offenses. Uh, is that the vast majority of people that in any way kind of act violently, uh, that it's important to understand the mitigating circumstances and the context. Uh, one is just understanding mental illness, uh, understanding uh, childhood traumas, uh, going into it, recognizing, as you already acknowledged, uh, Liz, that so many of those who are uh, perpetrators have been perpetrated uh, and oftentimes acting out of trauma. And for us in, in ministry, for us that are, uh, you know, that have been given the task, the mission to go in and to serve those that are incarcerated, uh, those that are nonviolent offenders, those that are violent offenders, those that are sex offenders, uh, is we go in recognizing the complexity of human nature uh, the, that the story of, of redemption is oftentimes messy and complicated. Uh, and, and yet we are going in there not as those uh, to bring about judgment. Many, most all have already been judged, you know, kind of by society in many ways. But we are now kind of tasked with the important work of restoration and, and of reconciliation. And I think the more that we in prison, those of us that are involved in prison ministry have a, a greater appreciation of the, the degree of mental illness, the degree that poverty, yeah. that isolation uh, contributes to people acting violently, I think will make us more equipped in, in bringing about uh, God's redemption, both mind, body, and soul. And, and, I, and I think to segue, and, and the piece of that as well is, is addiction. A lot of these men, and, and again, is severe addictions that were, they were caught up with the mental illness piece that have, that have led to the, the, these choices with the complexity of it. Yeah. So that was a, uh, that was a really good talk. Um, I was, I was reflecting about it and, you know, oftentimes in our pastoral ministry, we walk with individuals whose stories are more complicated than we might feel equipped to address. So, Special thanks to our panelists, um, Liz and Father Dustin. Thank you for walking us through. Thank you for your insights and for your experiences and for your wisdom. And special thanks to those who join us, and especially for the first time who came to join us. Thank you. We would love to have you back for our webinar for next month. Um, we will be posting this webinar in our website, and don't forget to check our website catholicprisonministries.org go under resources and webinars and you'll see our previous webinars and you'll see a series of webinars that we'll have for 2020 and for next month again our webinar mark your calendars for march 10 with um, father mike kennedy and and uh and robert garcia on how to minister to juveniles and any last words any last thoughts Oh, I, I, I forgot the webinar would be one o'clock Eastern Standard Time for next month. That's on a Tuesday and 10 o'clock Pacific. 
Any last thoughts, any last words, Liz and Father Dustin? No, I was, was going to say, Raymond, that obviously the webinar, the, the PowerPoint will be yours sharing and will be up for those that want to reference it again. But certainly, I'm happy to share my email if anyone wanted to reach out and had questions I didn't get to or questions for me. I'd be more than happy to email with anyone. I, I you know, I feel strongly about the, the topic we talked about today and the work that all of you are doing and administering. And so, again, if I know that we only had an hour and I'm sure there was lots of questions um, we didn't get to. So I apologize for that. But if there were people that wanted um, more discussion or questions, I'm happy to share my email and, and reach out to people that wanted more information or information I didn't get to them. Sure. And initially, they can send an email to cpmc.manager at gmail.com and it will forward it to you. Again, cpmc.manager at gmail.com. Father Dustin, any last words? Nothing, nothing for me. Just again, I, I really appreciate, uh, Liz, your, your presentation and all the work that you're doing. I, my, my, my experience is uh, so many of these men and certainly women uh, are the lepers among lepers, are the, those that are the most least served. Uh, and it's an opportunity for the church to do, pick up and, and do the work of Christ and, and serving those that are indeed that uh, have become, due to circumstances, perhaps their own actions as well, have become the least among us. So thank you, Liz, for all the, the good work that you're doing. Thank you to your, your work and obviously all these attendees that are doing their ministry work because certainly these men need people in their lives that believe in redemption as we talked about. So that's it's great work. And with that, we formally end our webinar. Thank you so much and see you next month.